Hey guys, you're looking at a combat encounter in, in my actual live game, the game that I play with my players. And, you know, you're seeing uh, some flashing animations from JB2A, and there's actually another few modules at work here that make my battles go quickly. And you're also seeing uh, effects that get applied, attacks and damages resolving automatically, um, even when there's complicated things like damage resistance or distance and other factors that, you know, frankly, for me as a GM, I, I don't ever seem to get straight. And including like remembering things like available reactions, like a shield spell. And, but what you're not, what you don't realize necessarily just by looking at this is that one module is really powering all of these other modules, these effects and all this automation. And that's MIDI QOL. So this is the first video of a three-part series where I actually interview the MIDI QL developer, Tim Posny in a sort of a conversation slash tutorial slash demo that actually spanned a couple of hours. So in it, we're going to, we're going to deep dive into MIDI QL, including its functions and also what modules it powers and how you can combine all these things for maximum effect. And there's probably a dozen, at least modules that it, that it powers. And, um, and when you understand it, you, you can not only speed up your combat, but you can give your players some some quality of life improvements, but also just leave them gasping at a VTT experience that I think you can only really get with Foundry and, and some of these modules like, like MIDI QOL. So, uh, so with that, let's jump into it. Great. So, Hey everybody, I am excited to show this to you today. I've got on, on this session here, Tim Posny, he's a developer. And if you're not aware, he's the developer behind MIDI QOL. And, uh, so Hey Tim, how you doing? Hi, good. Thanks. Great. I, so I, I've been really wanting to do this for a while because I tell you what, I've been using MIDI QL since before it was MIDI QL. It was what it used to be MIDI QL or what was the yep. pre predecessor? Mini. And I've been using it so long that I honestly don't know what Stock Foundry does or does not do anymore. <laughs> like I, every single instance I've got, I've got MIDI QL installed, but it's become this whole thing and it works with all these other modules and it does so much that uh you know people ask all the time when they get into like automating foundry like what what is this thing and it, it's like pretty big like it you know it just accomplishes a lot and so this session is about going into detail about what midi ql does what it's meant to do you know common maybe common issues that people might might have that you want to let them know about here in the video. But I tell you what, as far as like one of my core modules, this is it. But even I don't really understand everything that it's doing and why it's doing it. So okay. thanks for making the time. This this should be this should be fun. No um, problem. Now before you jump into showing us some of the things it can do, like you know, why why did you make this module and, and sure. who's it really for? It's for people really it's designed to help automate combat. Um, I hate having to once a dice is rolled, do all the ads, mm. think about all the special conditions that might happen, whether this particular attack should have advantage because your opponent is a an undead and you've got a special feature that allows you to do that, whether you've got immunity to particular damage types and remembering to apply that when, the, when it's done, all those sorts mm. of things that make calculating um, stuff in D&D tedious, I wanted to take away. Also, the group I play with really doesn't like having to press too many buttons on screen. Mm. So they really like to be able to press an at one button to do an attack and have everything resolved for them. And that's really the sort of the basis of the motivation. Well, I tell you what, that's probably why I use this. I have young players. I, I play with my sons and some of them are younger than others, but it is really hard to get them to know how to start calculating things. And, you know, just that the fact this takes care of it for all of us yeah. makes my life easier. Well, interesting enough, I've got older players, but the motivation's the same. Mm, yeah. Now, is this, I'm a D&D &D 5e guy. That's the game system that we play in. Is, does this work with other game systems? Is this, no, it's only D&D oh, &D 5e. Okay, great. I thought that might be the case. Uh, because yep. it's so rule specific and you're looking up all these D and D specific attributes and Correct. making decisions on them. Okay, great. All right. Well, 
I would love to see this thing in action. It looks like you've got something prepared for us. Yep, I've got an encounter set up. It's actually got players from my game, so it, it's got the things that they have and the sorts of abilities characters might normally get. So if I just... I've got an encounter set up. I use combat utility belt to hide the names of the other creatures. So you'll see in the in, encounter the baddies are marked as unknown creature. Mm-hmm. Hey, by However, the way, what's this artwork that I'm looking at? This is a great little map. All right, this is a battle map from Venetus Maps, who's on Patreon, and he has lots of good maps that you can use, some of them quite simple, some complicated. Sometimes when you've got just a random encounter, you actually want a fairly simple map, so this is just one I pulled up. I've looked at a lot of uh, Venetus Maps, or however you pronounce it, and they're yeah. amazing, really a, a ton of assets. In fact, I'll link to it in the, in the video description. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. I use a lot of different map assets, I must say. Um, yours, obviously, but a variety <laughs> yeah. of others as well. And there's just so much good artwork available that you can do anything you want. I also use Moulinet to bring in uh, scenes pre-configured and everything, which I would also suggest is a huge time saver. I love Moulinet, yeah. Great. So this scene's pretty simple. I've got a bunch of player characters, as I said. One of them is flying, so you can see over the over the wall, mm-hmm. this guy here. You'll see when I select the other character, it disappears from you and the walls come in. That's using um, better walls, I think it is, which is actually really nice. Um, and the advantage is that MIDI understands about wall heights if they're present. So this guy, for example, could target an attack the baddie that I'm highlighting, but this guy couldn't, A, because he can't see it, but because it goes through a wall, it'll get blocked. Hmm. But let's just have a look at, um, I thought maybe it's worthwhile just starting with the settings because that tends to be quite daunting for people. So yeah, the mini qual settings confuse a lot of people, probably with good reason, because there's a lot of them. There are three tabs that are particularly important. Um, the first one is GM, and that configures how roles done by the GM are going to behave. There are a couple of concepts. There's the auto roll attack, and what that means is if you click on the icon for a character, so for example, if I clicked on Warhammer, that will roll the attack and then skip the dialogue. Sorry, we will roll the attack. If fast forward is enabled, then that will skip the dialogue for whether you want um, advantage and disadvantage. In my game, I always use all of those disabled because I trust it to get most of the conditions correct. Great. So you Um, enable and disable fast forward from this screen also, it looks like. Correct. Okay. You can just see it here where the mouse is, fast forward, attack and damage. There's a similar tab for players because they have their own settings. So in some games, people like to roll dice and they like to click on buttons, but GMs typically want things to be fast and easy for them. So you have a separate set of settings for players. Hmm. Then the next one, which is the biggest and most complicated screen, is the workflow. Now, the way MIDI works is when you click that attack button or the item button, it launches a workflow that will go through a sequence of steps. So the first thing it does is work out who's targeted. Typically, those, that's the creatures that you target by double-clicking or single-clicking if you GM, so that that mummy lord is targeted. Alternatively, you can have an area of effect, effect spell, like a fireball. When you place the template, there's a setting to allow MIDI to auto-target all of the people within the template. Yes, great. So that's here. And it says always ignore defeated or walls block. So you've got a choice as to how those, that template placement works. Mm-hmm. The next section is called specials. It's probably in the wrong space because it happens generally at the end. But it covers things that normally you wouldn't see in the D&D game. So the first one is macros to call when an item is used. And I'll talk about those a bit later. Auto apply effects to targets. That's the big one, because what that does is it says if you've got an item with an effect on it, when the target is hit, it will apply those effects to the target. Hmm. So let's just do an example roll. So what that's done, if you have a look over here in the chat log, 
It's done an attack. It's adjudicated that it hit Sailor because the roll was above his armor class, and it's then prompted for a saving throw. I'm using Monk's token bar here to prompt players for their saving throws. You can also use Let Me Roll That For You, and it's up to you which module you prefer. You can even have it completely automated so that there's no prompt at all. So let's say I'll do the saving throw. Fascinating. Um, See, I'm using Monk's token bar, and I didn't even know I could do this with it. Yeah. Right. So what happened is he did the saving throw and he failed. So what's happened to Sayella is he's had the Rotting Fist active effect applied, which is Rotting Fist, which happens is just a placeholder that I created. It could be any active effect that you want. And in fact, this has got an extra feature, which was, is one of the other bits here. You'll see that Rotting Fist doesn't actually have any active effects defined at all. But what, it, what I do have set here is apply convenient effects. And this is another integration that works really nicely. Convenient effects is a module that defines all sorts of effects that can apply to creatures, all sorts of spell effects, all of the standard conditions, or ones that you create yourself. And what I've done is created an effect called Rotting Fist. And so when the attack hit and the creature saved, it automatically went to convenient effects and got the Rotting Fist effect. Wow. So, Tim, what kind of setup was required to get here? Uh, did you just have to install modules? Did you have to, in, uh, you know? I had to, I installed modules and then I had to create the effect for Rotting Fist within Convenient Effects. So, but for the I, most part, those effects were created in the standard module, but you just created a special one? Is that correct. the idea? Okay. So, let me show you, for example, a haste spell. Can you upcast it so you can target two? Or is it smart enough to know? It's not smart enough to know about upcasts um, that increase numbers of targets. So you'd actually have to change the spell to have multiple targets. Oh, I see. That's on the list. It's actually quite complicated to get the right information. Is it possible to just apply the haste effect to the second target just Absolutely. using the... So you can use convenient effects. Great. So you can just do that. Wonderful. The problem with doing that is that the haste spell created on, the haste effect created on this guy has a duration that's been mm -hmm. set from the, sp the spell. I'm not sure if the convenient effect does. Ah, oh, convenient effect does as well. So yeah, that's absolutely fine. Great. You're going to talk about durations and what's powering those as well, right? Sure. I can do that now, or I can, I'll probably come back to that because it applies in a few other areas. Great. So if that's sort of sidestepped us into effects, which is one of the useful features. Hits, you can have many auto check hits. Everyone can see the result or just the GM or don't check it at all. If you say don't check, that basically stops the workflow there and then. All right, then there's reactions. This is fairly new. If you have items that have a reaction available, then MIDI will prompt you to do the reaction. So for example... Tim, by the way, when you say items, you mean any item, spell, or feat? Correct. Right? Okay. Anything that's got reaction set in its activation conditions. So let's have a look, for example, at the shield spell. So you see this is marked as activation cost one reaction. Yeah. MIDI looks for those, and if it's... Um, prepared and it has a reaction type, then it will prompt you to cast it if you're hit. So let's, for example, do a hit from this guy. Uh, we'll do the rotting fist again. Oh, I've got two guys. But, sorry, what happened then is that it warned me that the target I was attacking was out of range because I hadn't oh. remembered to target the new guy. Wow. So that's another feature we'll come back to. It's in the optional rules, but you can check quite a few things that people forget about by using those optional rules. So what it did, it blocked the attack from happening. And so if you were gonna consume spell slots or anything, it saves you wasting that. Okay, so I missed. It's the problem with attacking a guy with really high armor class. <laughs> okay, this time it hit. So it says he's hit by running foot, fist and can use your action. The attack roll total was 28. And you can, figure, you can configure whether you want the player to see that or not. Because hmm. um, this will pop up on the player who controls Luthar's screen. It's popping up on the same screen because I'm GM, so everything's okay, happening yeah. in the same spot. So let's say I say, yes, I want to cast a shield spell. 
And you'll see what happened is that the 28 was wow. rolled. <laughs> Love it. Now he missed because Luther's now had the shield spell cast on him. So you can see that he's updated. And his armor class has gone up by the appropriate five from the shield spell. So it's 32. So the attack missed instead of hitting. Is that what's causing that um, animated shield? It turns out it's actually the convenient effect. Okay. So you've got a timed effect that, that's going to last one round for yep. shield. And it has a special. So convenient effects can also apply visual things like this, not just the tag. Uh, Correct. Okay. So let's just go through and have a look what the um, convenient effect is. In active effects, if you want to be able to look at it, you actually have to duplicate it as custom. Interesting. So the effects that it's got... An AC dot bonus, which is just a completely standard um, D and D five E effect, so it adds fire to armor class. And the second one is special in that it's a dynamic active effects option called macro dot token magic. I don't want to go too much into what DAE does because there's a lot, but basically it lets you an, a, apply a token magic effect to the target. So I also need to install token magic. Uh, if you want those effects to work, yes. Okay, and then I need, once I do that, I also, do I need to also import all of those filters into my world from the no, macro? No, DAE looks at all the predefined filters and ah, makes them available. Great. And you can see here in this field, it's actually got a list of all the ones that it knows about. Oh, good. That's so amazing. It's actually okay. point and click. We're going to have to do a whole other session on DAE because <laughs> that's some real eye candy. But okay, great. So, so far we've, we've installed convenient active effects, token magic effects, and most of this is working out of the box once those yep. are installed. Great. So you need dynamic active effects. Now, the other thing that I'll show you is the automatic expiry. So let's have a look here. So this was cast on an arbitrary player's turn. Let's just advance it to Luthar's turn, who's got the shield. If it says one round, normally it would expire at the start of Ido's turn, but you'll see that this effect, there we go, special duration, expires at the start of the target's next turn in combat. So instead of lasting for a whole round, it should expire at the start of Luthar's turn, which it did. Now, and for that, those was a, that was a DAE setting right there that we were looking at? That particular one is from another module called Time's Up. Mm, great. Anything, anytime you want to expire thing effects or anything, in fact, based on time or combat rounds, you need Time's Up. So that's the module that handles all the expiry of things on a time basis. And Tim, what we're talking about here and why we're pausing on some of these modules is, you know, you built this in such a way that other module creators can interact with MIDI yep. QOL. And so to really maximize what MIDI can do, we're talking about some of these other modules that you know can handle some of these major functions. Yeah. Um, to be fair, there's a little bit of a cheat there because I wrote Times Up and Dynamic Active Effects as well. Okay. So well, it's not surprising that they play nicely together. There you go. But for example, Convenient Effects is a completely different author, but uses a lot of the features for applying things. So there are lots of so you'll see that it's got effects and it's relying on MIDI qual effects to have those effects. So for example, it pr provides disadvantage on ability checks, uses a D&D &D flag, um, initiative disadvantage. So it's bringing together things from different places. We saw that it uses DAE effects as well. So there's quite a lot of interaction going on between the various modules. And so is it fair that, that MIDI actually enables more flags and things to be a lot more than, flags, yes. Than Core Foundry? Okay. Yep. So it has, in fact, I'll show you. It's a little bit daunting, but... So if you look here, here are all the um, MIDI qual specific flags that there are, and there's a lot. Wow. So there's things like advantage and disadvantage, auto-failing or auto-succeeding attacks, skills, um, critical hits, um, wow. a pile of things. 
Um, they're almost all, sorry, I should be saying they're all documented, but occasionally I forget uh, in the README or there's a spreadsheet that has all of the flags detailed as well. I would recommend people who are just getting into the module do have a look at the README. It's got a lot of stuff in it, quite a few people have contributed, and it's reasonably up to date. Um, I'll, I'll love to, I'd love to link the README in the spreadsheet from the video description if you think that'd be sure. helpful. So we'll end that session uh, right there for today. Uh, tune in for the next part two of the three-part series where we uh, go into more of the settings of MIDI QL and talk about some of the other things that you can do with it and actually show you guys some of that stuff as well.